elimination. Interrelated concepts uh, and exemplars here include infections, uh, specifically cystitis and UTI, renal calculi, also known as urolithiasis, acute kidney injury, also known as AKI, chronic kidney disease, known as CKD, end-stage renal disease, and benign prostatic hypertrophy. The interrelated concepts include digestion, fluid and electrolyte balances, tissue integrity, comfort, stress, and coping. Elimination is defined as the excretion of waste products from the body by the lungs, skin, gastrointestinal tract, and by the kidneys. Urinary elimination occurs as a result of multiple kidney processes and ends with the passage of urine through the urinary tract. When the urge to void occurs, urine will be passed from the bladder through the urinary sphincter, urethra, and meatus. Urine will consist of water and metabolic waste products, also known as toxins, from many chemical processes that occur in the body. Urinary elimination control also depends on multiple factors, including muscle strength and nerve function. Bowel elimination is accomplished through peristalsis, which is a wave-like muscular contraction that helps propel food and digestive products through the digestive tract. Now, this material that it is propelling through the digestive tract is actually called chyme, which is a thick semi-fluid mass that's formed in the stomach. Nutrients and water are going to be absorbed into the bloodstream from the small intestine and unabsorbed chyme travels through the large intestine and then is expelled from the anus. Feces will consist of digestive wastes, water, bile, epithelial cells, minerals, bacteria, and mucus. Now, we do need to look at lifespan considerations. With newborns, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, these children are typically between the ages of 18 and 24 months before they're able to identify the urge to urinate and defecate. Toilet training will help them gain conscious control over these functions, and most children will be potty trained between the ages of two and three. Understand that accidents can happen often at a young age because children don't always heed that urge to urinate or defecate. Events such as a new baby or moving to a new house can also cause temporary regression in these habits. With pregnant women, as the fetus grows, increased pressure will be placed on the bladder, and this causes frequent urination. There are larger volumes of urine because there is a larger blood volume during gestation. And then the fetus can also interfere with intestinal peristalsis, which can lead to constipation. We also know that prenatal vitamins with iron can also contribute to constipation, not the vitamins themselves, but the iron. As we age, by the age of 80 years, renal blood flow will reduce to an estimated 600 mLs per minute, and the kidneys will lose up to 50% of functioning nephrons. Now, this does not change the older adult's ability to produce urine sufficiently to maintain normal composition of body fluids, but it does represent reduced renal reserve, and this makes the older adult more susceptible to fluid and electrolyte imbalances and kidney damage due to medications. And although the bladder retains tone with age, the volume of urine that can be held will get smaller, and this leads to urinary frequency. 
In many older adults, muscles around the urethra will become weak, and this increases the risk of incontinence, especially in women who have had multiple pregnancies or vaginal childbirth. Age-related changes that affect bowel elimination include atrophy of smooth muscle layers in the colon and reduced mucus secretions. Reduced tone of the internal and external sphincter and reduced neural impulses, which will reduce the sensation of bowel evacuation, can also make the older adult more susceptible to constipation or incontinence. Impaired elimination refers to one or more problems with the elimination process. Most problems and conditions can be grouped by common themes and include incontinence, retention, discomfort, infections and inflammation, neoplasms, and organ failure. Continence is defined as the voluntary control of both bowel and urinary elimination, which we all shoot for, right? Incontinence is the lack of bowel or bladder control. Retention is an inability to expel stool or excrete urine. Risk factors for these changes include control issues that arise as a result of underdeveloped elimination mechanisms, mal malfunctions in the mechanism of elimination, alterations in cognition, or with significant urge and the inability to access a bathroom. Incontinence is often due to aging, neurologic disorders, and excessive uses of laxatives. Genitourinary and gastrointestinal disturbances and or diseases. Whereas retention from the urinary aspect, we're looking at BPH or that benign prostatic hyper, hypertrophy, where we have an overgrowth of the prostate tissue, urinary tract obstructions, and chronic kidney disease. With bowel retention, we are looking at decreased peristalsis, constipation, a lack of dietary fiber, exercise, or potentially certain medications. Physiologic consequences of changes in elimination, we can have skin irritation or breakdown, develop fungal infections, have fluid and electrolyte imbalances, dehydration, and hypokalemia. With retention, we could have bladder rupture, bowel impaction, or intestinal obstruction. And this can lead to changes in activities of daily living, functional activities, and social relationships. Impaired elimination refers to one or more problems with the elimination process. Again, most problems and conditions can be grouped by those common themes and include incontinence, retention, discomfort, infections and inflammation, neoplasms, and organ failure. So risk factors for changes in elimination include control issues that arise as a result of those underdeveloped elimination mechanisms, malfunctions in the mechanism of elimination, and alterations in cognition or with significant urge and the ability to access a bathroom. So we've kind of already talked about those, but just to review. So now let's talk about the different types of urinary incontinence. We have stress incontinence, which is leakage of small amounts of urine during physical movement, such as coughing, sneezing, exercising, laughing, 
urge incontinence is leakage of large amounts of urine at unexpected times, including during sleep. Basically, it is feeling the urge to urinate, and if you don't get to the bathroom right this second, then you're probably going to have incontinence. The overactive bladder, we have leakage of large amounts of urine at unexpected times, including during sleep. So this bladder um, is constantly being stimulated to urinate and people don't always have the ability to get to the bathroom when they feel that urge. Functional incontinence is untimely urination because of a physical disability, external obstacles, or cognitive problems that prevent the person from reaching the toilet. So let's say we have an older adult who has arthritis and they find it difficult to move and they don't move very fast. They feel that urge to urinate and by the time they're able to get to the bathroom and maybe even unfasten their pants and get their pants pulled down, they've already had leakage. Or maybe they use a walker and trying to get the walker through the doorways and into the bathroom to the toilet sometimes may take longer than anticipated and they have leakage. Overflow incontinence is an unexpected leakage of small amounts of urine because the bladder is too full. Mixed incontinence usually occurs with stress and urge incontinence together. And transient incontinence is leakage that occurs temporarily because of a situation that will pass, such as a urinary tract infection maybe a new medication such as a diuretic or colds that have coughing. Due to aging, neurologic disorders and excessive uses of laxatives or diuretics can also lead to incontinence. And again, that genitourinary and gastrointestinal disturbances and or diseases. So with retention, Again, the primary mechanisms causing retention are usually associated with obstruction, inflammation, or ineffective neuromuscular activation within the bladder or the GI tract. So let's look at the re renal side first. Medications that can cause urinary retention include antidepressants, anticholinergics, and antihistamines. Postoperative patients may have problems with urinary elimination as a result of the effects of anesthetics or the use of catheters during the surgical procedure. If you think about it, anesthesia not only puts the mental part of us to sleep, but it also can cause that peristaltic wave-like activity to be slowed down or temporarily stopped while that anesthesia is in effect. And then we have psychosocial factors such as fear or anxiety that can affect the ability to successfully void. Some people just have what we call shy bladders. They can't pee if someone else is in the room. With the gastrointestinal tract, Retention can occur if the urge to defecate is ignored and the stool then becomes difficult to eliminate. It can also occur as a side effect to many medications, including narcotic pain medications, or can occur secondarily to reduced peristalsis or intestinal blockage. It will result in constipation, which is defined as the difficult passage of hard, dry stool. Not necessarily the number of days they've gone without a bowel movement, because some people may only have 
a bowel movement every four to five days or up to a week. So we look at the characteristics of the stool. If it is difficult to pass, sometimes painful, and the stool is really hard and dry, that is constipation. Urinary obstruction can include the benign prostatic hypertrophy seen in the older man. Again, urinary tract obstructions and chronic kidney disease. With the bowel, once again, <coughs> excuse me, this is decreased peristalsis, constipation, that lack of dietary fiber, a lack of exercise and medications. Discomfort. Urinary discomfort is associated with inflammation, and that is often associated with infection of the urinary tract or the bladder being distended, which is associated with urinary retention. Bowel elimination discomfort is associated with constipation, excessive flatus or gas, abdominal cramping, and diarrhea. Other causes of discomfort include inflammation or injury to the anus, presence of hemorrhoids, both internal and external hemorrhoids, and fissures, along with gastrointestinal infections or inflammation. So what happens to our body when we have impaired inflammation? Well, we can have skin irritation or breakdown. There are chemicals being excreted in the urine and the feces that are not supposed to be in prolonged contact with the skin. And if we have prolonged contact, then it can begin to cause skin breakdown. If you think about the feces, if we have diarrhea, you know, think about what is in the abdomen, what's in the stomach. Well, we have hydrochloric acid in the stomach, right? And if we have diarrhea, that means things are moving through the GI tract very quickly. So what's happening is now this acid is going through the GI tract and out the anus and getting on the skin. So having excoriation, which is that um, abnormal uh, irritation and breakdown of the skin can occur. And we can actually develop open wounds and sores from that. We also know that other physiologic consequences of elimination changes include falls because the client is rushing to get to the bathroom. Social lifestyle, relationship consequences, depression and withdrawal. People know they're incontinent, the smells, and they don't want to be around other people because it's embarrassing. Pain, chronic bladder infection, and bladder distension uh, are also consequences. Distension can lead to urinary reflux, also known as a backflow, that leads to dilation of the ureters, and then can lead to pyelonephritis, the infection of the kidney, and renal atrophy. With all of that moisture, this is a prime area for fungal infections to uh, take hold. We have the fluid and electrolyte imbalances, dehydration, hypokalemia if we're urinating too much. With retention, again, bladder rupture, bowel impaction, intestinal obstruction. And this can lead to changes in activities of daily living and functional activities. The complete loss of renal function will represent significant physiological consequences because we now have an inability to remove the toxins and the metabolic waste. This will result in fluid and electrolyte and acid-based disturbances, and if left untreated, will lead to death. 
The consequences of excessive fecal retention includes pain, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting. An ileus refers to a loss of peristaltic activity in the gastrointestinal tract. In other words, it becomes paralyzed. This can occur subsequent to abdominal trauma or surgery and is also associated with nausea, vomiting, and distension. That vomiting with a blockage or sometimes the paralytic ileus can be more of a projectile vomiting. Although rare, rupture of the colon can occur and that will represent a life-threatening situation. So risk factors for urinary incontinence include advanced age, female gender, menopause, multiparity, meaning they've been pregnant more than once, obesity, smoking, impaired mobility, trauma or surgery of the pelvic region, impaired cognition or a debilitated state, and neurologic disorders such as stroke, spinal injury, or a brain tumor. Urinary retention risk factors include advanced age, male gender, prostate enlargement, inflammation, or infection, pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic mass, pelvic trauma or surgery, and medications such as anticholinergics or sympathomimetics. Fecal incontinence risk factors include advanced age, diarrhea, impaired mobility, impaired cognition, the debilitated state, and injury or a chronic condition that affects the neural pathways. Fecal retention includes advanced age, female gender, pregnancy, lower income. Why do you think lower income? Well, think about diet and foods that they can afford. The healthier foods are the foods that are going to be higher in fiber. The less healthy foods don't have the amount of fiber that our bodies require. Poorly educated, maybe they don't know what they should be doing to prevent constipation. A sedentary lifestyle, in other words, a couch potato. Dehydration, chronic conditions, inflammatory bowel syndrome and depression, and medications such as opioids, diuretics, antidepressants, aluminum-based antacids. So how do we prevent impaired function? Primary prevention measures are going to be aimed at maintaining optimal health and preventing the onset of disease through the reduction of risks. So with environmental, let's avoid contaminated water and foods. We know that bacteria in water or food can cause diarrhea and colitis. Parasites can also be present in water or food that's not properly prepared. Parasites not only can cause elimination problems, but they can also affect the overall health. Maintaining hydration. Water is a key element for prevention of bowel and urinary elimination problems. It's absorbed by the stool to soften it and then promote intestinal motility, which assists in the elimination of the stool. And water also increases volume, reduces bladder irritation, and helps eliminate toxins from the body. Dietary fiber intake has been shown to prevent stool retention, especially when combined with adequate water intake and exercise. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration recommends 25 grams of fiber per day based on a 1,000 kilocalorie diet. Now, it's also important to understand that dietary fiber is important to not only prevent fecal retention, but also to help treat diarrhea. 
Physical activity will increase intestinal peristalsis, which reduces the time for food matter to move through the intestines. It's also important to help prevent bladder retention because it helps with that peristaltic activity. Regular toileting practices. If we maintain a consistent time of defecation, we find this is really important in the regulation of bowel movements. Ignoring that urge to defecate can lead to constipation. To prevent urinary incontinence or retention, there should be timely and complete emptying of the bladder. Holding urine should be discouraged because this encourages bacterial growth in the bladder, which leads to urinary tract infections. And then we have secondary prevention, and this is mainly associated with screenings. Two common screening tests associated with elimination are screening for occult blood, so we have blood in the stool, and a colonoscopy. Both are considered effective for the detection of colon cancer. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends screening for colorectal cancer beginning at the age of 50 years until 75 years of age and this recommendation is grade A. However, some of the more recent studies are beginning to change that early age to 45 instead of 50. The two categories of screening are stool-based tests and direct visualization tests. Stool-based tests, the guaiac-based fecal occult blood test, the fecal immunochemical test or multi-targeted stool DNA test are recommended annually. Now the guaiac based test is routinely done as part of a rectal exam. Basically, uh, the rectal exam is done with a finger and we remove a little bit of stool after inserting the finger into the anus and then put this on the card and then we either send it to lab or we apply the solution to determine if there's any blood in in the stool. Direct visualization tests will include the colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. These are recommended every 10 years or more often if the client has certain risk factors. And then we have screening for prostate cancer. It's the only screening associated with urinary elimination. And of course, this has to do with the male population. The recently revised recommendations is for periodic prostate-specific antigen, also known as a PSA-based screening of men from ages 40 or 55 to 69. And it should be more of an individualized decision. The um, organizations recommend against screening for prostate cancer in men over the age of 70, but they also report insufficient evidence to support routine screening for bladder cancer. So how do we assess elimination? Assessment of elimination includes taking a history, conducting that physical examination, and performing diagnostic testing when problems are identified. So for example, we ask about patterns of urinary and bowel elimination. How often do you go? When do you go? What does it look like? Does it have an abnormal odor to it, an abnormal consistency, etc.? Determine if there have been changes in the diet, recent changes in their health status, such as cognition or mobility, functional ability, or other medical conditions, and if there's new medications or changes in medications. Adults of all ages should be asked about urinary continence. The physical assessment incorporates four examination techniques, inspection, auscultation, palpation, and percussion. We should always inspect for any abnormalities such as redness, edema, pain, 
abnormal contours, discharge, lesions, etc. Inspection also includes looking at a stool or urine sample if available. We know that urine should be clear and yellow with a mild odor. If the urine is very dark, it may be indicative of dehydration or might be a side effect of medication or may indicate the presence of blood. We know that stools should be brown and formed. Stools that are black and tarry in appearance often signal gastrointestinal bleeding. However, understand if a client is taking iron supplements or a diet high in iron, stools can also be very dark in color, almost black. Loose stools or diarrhea may be associated with diet, inflammation, or infection. Auscultation comes next. Bowel sounds should be heard in all four quadrants. An absence of bowel sounds may be associated with that paralytic ileus. Hyperactive bowel sounds may be noted with gastrointestinal inflammation or maybe an intestinal obstruction. Auscultation is not indicated with a urinary assessment. The next step is palpation. The abdomen should be soft and non-tender with palpation over the entire abdomen and over the urinary bladder. If as a nurse we begin palpation and the client complains of pain, the nurse should stop palpating. We'll leave that up to the provider. Abdominal or urinary distension is considered an abnormal finding and it can be associated with reduced peristalsis or retention of stool or urine. Rectal palpation can be done to assess the rectal sphincter and to examine for the presence of masses, lesions, or impacted stool when indicated. This is not something that we routinely do. Providers do it more frequently than nurses. If we suspect there might be an impaction, then nurses will often assess for that. Digital palpation is also part of the prostate exam. Again, nurses don't typically do this. This is something the providers typically do. Although it's not directly an examination associated with elimination, we know that prostate enlargement can result from a tumor, whether it's benign or malignant, or an inflammation, and both can contribute to urinary retention. Now there's a number of diagnostic tests associated with elimination, and we have three categories. We have laboratory, radiographic, and direct observation. So the lab, we may get a urinalysis, which will determine the concentration of urine, the presence of bacteria, blood, ketones, glucose, etc. A 24-hour urine analysis uh, also will examine the urine, but we can gain more information from this. So let's talk about how we complete that 24-hour urinalysis. Once the order is received, we will have the client void and will discard that void. We begin the test with the next void, so mark the time. Save all voids for 24 hours. And right before that 24 hour time expiration, have the client void one last time. If a void is accidentally discarded within that 24 hours, we have to start the test all over again. And remember to keep that voided urine cool. We have renal function tests. This will include the blood urea nitrogen or BUN, serum creatinine, glomerular filtration, and creatinine clearance. When determining kidney function, serum creatinine will be more sensitive than the BUN. We can do a urine culture. If bacteria is found in the urine, it's often cultured to determine the microorganism causing the infection. 
If a parasitic infection is suspected in the bowel, we can do a stool culture. We can also test for occult blood in the stool, which can indicate a gastrointestinal bleed from inflammation, infection, or a tumor, hemorrhoids, or fissures. Pathology is going to take a piece of tissue from a suspicious area and look at it under the microscope for tumors or to determine general organ function. Imaging includes x-rays, computerized tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, and ultrasound. They can detect a variety of problems, including the presence of an intestinal tumor, a congenital renal abnormality, or kidney stones. Angiography is used to assess blood flow. And in this case, we would be looking at the renal blood flow and it can also indicate stenosis of those arteries. Direct observation visualizes the colon through a colonoscopy, the sigmoid colon through a sigmoidoscopy, the bladder through a cystoscopy, or the urethra or ureters through a uroscopy. These are done for screening or diagnostic purposes for polyps, cancer and inflammatory conditions such as Crohn's disease. With direct observation, we're also able to obtain biopsies. Other diagnostic tests include bladder stress testing, uroflometry, other urine flow studies, and post-void residual measurement through the use of bladder scans or post-void catheterization. So how do we treat elimination issues? Well, pharmacological agents. Start off with antibiotics. Although there's a variety of agents that can be used, trimethoprim, trimethoprim with sulfamethoxazole or nitrofurantone uh, are commonly prescribed for UTIs. Parenteral antibiotics would be indicated for more severe infections, such as pyelonephritis or sepsis. Antibiotics can also be used prophylactically if we have urinary retention or recurrent urinary tract infections. Diuretics. Diuretics will increase the volume of urine produced along with excreting sodium and potassium from the body by affecting the water reabsorption in the renal tubules. Loop diuretics will prevent reabsorption of sodium in the loop of Henle. Thiazide diuretics prevent sodium from being reabsorbed at the beginning of the distal convoluted tubules. Potassium sparing diuretics will stop the extensive loss of potassium at the distal convoluted tubules. Excessive use of diuretics to treat certain conditions will require careful monitoring, along with frequent lab testing of the electrolytes. Antispasmodics. Anticholinergics are often used to relieve smooth muscle spasms in the bowel or bladder, and they can provide relief from urinary incontinence. Some antispasmodic medications, such as Imodium, also known as loperamide, which is the generic, are effective for the treatment of diarrhea because they cause a reduction in peristalsis and slow the passage of stool. There are agents to manage constipation, and this will include both prescribed and over-the-counter versions of laxatives, bulk-forming agents, bowel stimulants, lubricants, stool softeners, saline laxatives, and enemas. One of the important things to remember when clients are taking this type of medication is they have to increase their fluid intake if tolerated. The drawback in using these medications is that the bowel can become dependent on laxatives and stimulants 
for the impulse to defecate. In other words, now they cannot defecate unless they take these medications. Medications for stool retention should be a last resort and should be discontinued as soon as bowel elimination is achieved. And analgesics. These are indicated for relief of mild discomfort to severe pain for select urinary or bowel elimination conditions, such as kidney stones, cystitis, urinary tract infections, bladder spasms, hemorrhoids, and rectal fissures. Incontinence man management requires multidisciplinary management of the person that, <coughs> excuse me, with alterations in elimination. And this has to be done to successfully control their condition. The need for retraining the bowel and bladder is very important. Providing a regular toileting schedule, managing fluid intake, modifying the environment, avoiding indwelling catheters, providing high quality skin care and assessment, and avoiding medications that contribute to incontinence are important. Using personal absorbent pads or bed protecting pads to catch episodes of incontinence in both the mobile and immobile individuals can be important. Biofeedback can also be used to assist the person in gaining improved control over the muscles of elimination. Among those that have dementia, toilet assistance, including timed voiding and prompted voiding, along with protective pads and skin care are pretty standard interventions. Some of the invasive procedures and surgical in interventions involving urinary elimination, well, we have to look at the benefits because these procedures can be very difficult on the body. And those benefits have to outweigh the risks for utilization because they can be invasive and sometimes life altering. The first one we look at is dialysis. This is indicated for acute or chronic renal failure. It involves filtration of the blood to remove toxins through an external process. There's two types of dialysis, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. With hemodialysis, we have a machine to filter the patient's blood to remove the excess to toxins and water. The blood will be circulated from the client to the dialysis machine and then back to the client over several hours. With peritoneal dialysis, we have a dialysis solution introduced into the peritoneal cavity, the abdomen and that will absorb toxins over several hours. And then through an exchange, that solution and waste are removed and new solution is then uh, introduced. Procedures that relieve urinary retention. Well, the most common procedure to relieve that is urinary catheterization. This could be intermittently performed with a straight cath or an indwelling calf can be inserted. Surgical intervention might be needed to treat other forms of obstructions, including surgery on the bladder, prostate, or ureters. And if there is a closure of one of those tubes, we can put a stent, which is a rigid tube, to help maintain the patency of the pathways for urinary elimination. We may need to remove renal calculi. This is also known as kidney stones or uh, urinary lithiasis. And they often require surgical intervention if the stones are unable to pass through the urinary tract. Procedures can include a lithotripsy, 
where we fragment the stones through sound wave technology, an endurologic procedure, which is the insertion of a ure ureteroscope and crushing the stones with a surgical instrument, instrument called a lithotrite, or open procedures such as a nephrolithotomy, pyelolithotomy, ureterolithotomy, or cystotomy, in which an incision is made and then the stone is surgically removed. A nephrectomy is occasionally done to surgically remove the kidney, uh, such as with renal cancer. Other conditions such as polycystic urinary disease may also require surgical intervention. Prostate surgery with the transurethral resection of the prostate, also known as a TURP, T-U-R-P, is a surgical procedure done for benign prostate hypertrophy, that BPH, when other non-invasive treatment measures have failed or a prostatectomy refers to the removal of the prostate and is usually performed among younger men diagnosed with prostate cancer, particularly if it's diagnosed in the early disease stage. Surgical interventions of the bladder might be necessary for a prolapsed bladder or a bladder cancer. Options include laser surgery, transurethral resection, and partial or total cystectomy or removal of the bladder. If the bladder is removed, then urinary diversion is required. Urinary diversion procedures will involve diverting the ureters to a urinary stoma on the skin, usually on the abdomen somewhere. So now they have an ostomy. The urinary diversion is required with a cystectomy, and it's also used in the treatment of other conditions such as bladder cancer, neurogenic bladder, or trauma to the bladder. Maintenance of skin integrity at the stoma site is really important. External urinary pouches are used in many cases to collect urine in these types of situations. Invasive procedures and surgical interventions that involve bowel elimination include uh, those that are associated with the colon, the rectum, and the anus, and they treat pathologic conditions or traumatic injury. A colectomy is also referred to as a colon resection, involves removing part of the bowel. This can be done because of disease to a portion of the bowel, such as a cancerous tumor or treatment for traumatic injury. Then the two ends of the remaining colon will be attached, and we call that an anastomosis. A colostomy or ileostomy is a diversion of the intestines, whether it's of the colon or the small intestine, through a stoma on the skin and that's occasionally needed on a temporary or permanent basis as a result of injured or diseased intestines, colon, or rectum. The use of external devices such as that colostomy pouch is required for the collection of stool. Maintenance of skin integrity around the stoma is going to be of utmost importance. We can do a rectal prolapse repair where the rectal prolapse is a condition that occurs when the rectum now falls into or through the anal opening. And this is most common among young children and the elderly, occurring from weak pelvic floor muscles or from excessive straining during bowel movements, such as with chronic constipation. Surgical repair is indicated if the prolapse occurs regularly or is associated with significant discomfort. A hemorrhoidectomy is a procedure that involves the excision of, <coughs> excuse me, 
internal or external hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids might require surgical intervention if topical treatments or changes in the diet don't eliminate their associated discomfort. And then fecal collection systems. These use a flexible tube that's inserted into the rectum to collect liquid stool and clients that have incontinence who are not candidates for bowel retraining or might have clostridium difficile and result in diarrhea. So just a few more things on urinary elimination. Factors that can affect elimination include our food and fluid intake, muscle tone, psychosocial factors, pathologic conditions, surgical and diagnostic procedures. Some of the altered urine production issues include polydipsia, where we have a really strong thirst. We're thirsty all the time. And that can result in polyuria, where we're getting rid of too much urine. Anuria is going to be the absence of urine. And oliguria is a very small amount of urine. And this can result in urinary frequency, nocturia, where we get up at night, dysuria, or pain with urination, urinary hesitancy, or a neurogenic bladder. There are some genetic considerations. If there's a family history, if there are some genetic conditions such as myelomeningocele or spina bifida, conditions that affect cognition such as Alzheimer's, or aging conditions such as Parkinson's disease can also affect our elimination. <coughs> Again, medications that can affect urinary elimination include diuretics, anticholinergics, antidepressants, antihistamines, antihypertensives, antiparkinson's drugs, beta-adrenergic blockers, and opioids. When you assess these clients, you get your interview and health history. We really need to know that voiding pattern, description of the urine, and are there any changes, any problems with urinary elimination? What is their fluid intake, environmental factors, stress, disease, any diagnostic procedures or surgeries that have been done? Then as we examine the client, we look at the abdomen, we're going to palpate the bladder, we're looking at the genitalia, the perineum, the urethral meatus, the urine, and the fluid volume status. As nurses, we will monitor intake and output, monitor uh, what fluids they're getting, making sure they're getting adequate fluids, do catheter care and skin care, collect urine specimens, and provide teaching. Other people that may be involved include radiologist, urologist, wound or ostomy nurse, home health, medical supply companies that provide necessary equipment for home use. Some modifiable risk factors include obesity, UTIs, increased consumption of bladder irritants, or poor lifestyle habits. So a picture that shows you a suprapubic catheter that has been inserted through the abdomen into the bladder. It basically bypasses the urethra. This is the picture that is located on the left-hand side. So you see the actual catheter has now gone through the abdominal wall. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the uh, urinary diversion where the ureters have been brought to the ab abdominal wall and formed a stoma. 
it is important with both of these to assess the skin around the site, the stoma or the catheter every shift. So which term describes a condition in which 24 hour urine output is less than 50 mLs? This is anuria. True or false? Diuretics cause increased urine production, resulting in the need for increased urination and possibly urge incontinence. This is true. True or false? Normal fresh urine has an ammonia or odor. This is actually false. That ammonia will develop after it has been sitting for a while. True or false? A urine specimen from a client with an indwelling catheter should be obtained from a collection receptacle. This is false. We get it from the collection port, which is located close to the uh, pigtail of the catheter. True or false? There are no interventions effective for preventing urinary incontinence. And we know this is false. So with a urinary tract infection, I'd like for you to look at the pictures on the right hand side. We have a device to secure the catheter to the client's leg. This prevents abnormal tugging of the catheter on the meatus, which those catheters, if they are improperly placed, can actually tear through the meatus. So it's important to make sure that there's not too much tension. And then it goes to what we call a, le a leg bag. And this bag can be used for day purposes if they have a continuous catheter. And if you look at the right hand picture, this is showing the appropriate way to cleanse a catheter. We always cleanse it away from the meatus. So a general UTI is an infection of the bladder, kidney, urethra, or prostate, and it will be classified according to the region and the site affected. With a lower UTI, this can be urethritis, which would involve the urethra, prostatitis involving the prostate, and cystitis, <coughs> excuse me, which is the most common and involves the urinary bladder. An upper UTI would be pyelonephritis, which involves the kidney or the renal pelvis. Overall causes of UTIs include bowel incontinence. Uh, the feces gets to the meatus and then travels up the urethra. Sexual activities, urinary obstruction, calculi, or improper cleaning. You know, women should always wipe front to back only, should never wipe back to front because that draws the feces to the urethra and then can lead to UTIs. So basically what happens with the UTI is bacteria enters from the ascending mucous membranes of the perineum to the lower urinary tract, and E. coli is the most common cause of UTIs, and this comes from the bowel. From the blood, we can also have bacteria that gets into the urinary tract system, but this is pretty rare. We have two different categories. We have uncomplicated, where we have an isolated incidence or complicated where we have more than two UTIs every year. Symptoms include urgency, frequency, dysuria, that pain, hematuria or blood in the urine, nocturia, the getting up at night, bacteria, cloudy, foul-smelling urine, 
incontinence, fever, chills, and fatigue. In the older adult, we often see confusion as the first sign of infection. Diagnostics, we want to get that history and physical, do a urinalysis, and then do a urine culture with sensitivity. <coughs> Excuse me, the sensitivity is basically going to uh, determine which antibiotic is most effective at killing the bug that's causing the infection. Then we're going to administer antibiotics and urinary analgesics, uh, such as pyridium. We're going to increase fluids to eight to 10 glasses a day, preferably avoiding caffeine and alcohol. Encourage the client to empty their bladder every two to three hours while awake. They should avoid bubble baths, hygiene sprays, and douching. Teach females, again, to clean or wipe from front to back when doing perineal care. Wear cotton underwear because it's breathable and bacteria doesn't like that air. And maintain acidic urine with a pH below five, such as drinking cranberry juice and vitamin C. Cotties. These are catheter-associated urinary tract infections. They're most common, they are the most common urine, or, excuse me, they're the most common hospital-associated infection in the year of 2016. 70 to 80% of cotties are attributed to indwelling urethral catheters per the Joint Commission. So how do we prevent it? Make sure that we use sterile technique when inserting the catheter. Doing catheter care using soap and water every shift and hand washing. Remember with the uh, perineal care with the catheter, we start at the urethra and clean outward. Normal bowel elimination. Again, we talked about feces being ingested food that's not digested and moves through the GI tract and then will be eliminated through the anus. Defecation is that expulsion of the feces from the anus and the rectum, and we also call that a bowel movement or a stool. Frequency typically varies from several times a day to twice a week. Again, there are a few clients out there that may only go once a week. Feces is normally composed of 75% water and 25% solid material. It should be soft and formed, brown color due to the bilirubin and bile, and normal bacteria flora of the large intestine includes E. coli and Staphylococcus. So those normally live in the gut. Factors that affect bowel elimination are diet. We may have constipating foods such as cheese, lean meat, eggs, or pasta. Foods that have that laxative effect such as fruits and vegetables, bran, chocolate, alcohol, or coffee or gas producing foods such as onions, cabbage, beans, and cauliflower. The amount of fluid we take in, the amount of activity we engage in, our usual defecation habits, the medications we take, diagnostic procedures such as a colonoscopy is going to require us to clean the bowel out so they're taking laxatives or receiving enemas, pathologic conditions, pain, and psychologic factors. So some of the issues that we see with bowel elimination include diarrhea. Make sure that with diarrhea, you're answering call bells immediately and remove the cause of diarrhea whenever possible. For example, if it's a medication or something in their diet, 
if there's a risk of impaction, because we can sometimes see that liquid stool, but the client is impacted. Uh, it's just basically stool that leaks around that impacted stool. We should hold those antidiarrheal medications until we can evaluate the situation further. Flatulence or gas, constipation and bowel incontinence. So we need to determine the client's defecation pattern, a description of the feces and any changes they may have had, and factors that influence elimination, such as elimination aids. Do they take laxatives? What is their diet, their fluid intake, their exercise, their medication, their stress levels? We need to determine when their last bowel movement was and what did it look like? The color, consistency, shape, amount, was the color abnormal? Or I'm sorry, was there an abnormal odor? We assess the perineal area for redness or skin breakdown, especially if they're incontinent or having diarrhea. Assess for the presence of hemorrhoids. Assess their medications. Do they take laxatives or antidiarrheal agents or anti-flatulent agents? And we encourage them to maintain a healthy weight, exercise regularly, use good toileting habits, eat a healthy diet with fiber, modify any potential risk factors, and engage in screenings. This slide shows you placement of different ostomies. A is a sigmoid ostomy. B would be a descending ostomy. C is a transverse. D is ascending. And E is an ileostomy. So which food is recommended for an older adult who's constipated? That would be fruit.